Hi. Uh, today I'm going to talk about another hopefully interesting application of the kind of approach we took to solve the Laplace equation in the spherical coordinates under a certain symmetry condition. And the symmetry condition was that the, uh, the whole system looked invariant under the rotation about a certain axis, and that axis we took to be the z-axis, and we continue to keep up that tradition here. Uh, so what I'm going to assume is the situation shown in this uh, picture. So we have this uh, dielectric material with dielectric constant kappa, uh, which uh, has an infinite extent. It's a completely homogeneous system, except in this uh, small spherical region, which is sort of carved out of the dielectric material. And inside that, uh, inside the hollow region, hollow sphere, sits the dipole moment uh, of size p. So the dipole moment has a certain orientation, which we obviously take to be the z-axis. And, uh, and then we assume that there is an overall electric field, which is also pointing in that same direction. And of course, this makes perfect sense because when there is an electric field, then the dipole moment naturally wants to align itself uh, along with that electric field in order to minimize the energy. So this is a perfectly reasonable situation with both the dipole moment vector and the uh, external electric field E0 both pointing in the same direction, namely the Z direction. And as you can imagine, this whole system is, uh, can be rotated about the Z axis and creates a rotationally symmetric situation. And the question we want to solve is, uh, what exactly is the electric field generated under this uh, configuration. So when we only had the electric field, then there's not much to solve. And when we only have the dipole moment, when, uh, when there's only one dipole moment, we already know what the potential and the electric field due to that dipole is. So again, there's no issue. However, when both are present, then uh, then exactly how do these uh, how do th these two things play out? Well, of course, you can say that the result it must be just a superposition of whatever electric field generated by the dipole moment plus the uniform electric field E zero. And that would have made perfect sense if we were in a perfectly homogeneous medium. But you see the situation here is a bit more tricky because uh, it's, um, it's a hollow region and the hollow region has dielectric constant equal to one, uh, which is the hollow region is sort of embedded inside the dielectric region, which has a different dielectric constant other than one. So there's uh, a degree of inhomogeneity in this whole setup, which needs to be taken into account. So hopefully you can see that the problem is not entirely, uh, is not entirely, uh, entirely obvious. Okay, so we're going to set about the task of solving for the overall potential, electrostatic potential generated under this uh, circumstance. Um, so, as you know from uh, my lecture quite some time ago, the, a single dipole would generate such a potential, and, uh, and this potential would have an angular dependence of cosine theta, because uh, cosine theta is basically the uh, z-coordinate um, divided by the radius, divided by the distance r, of course. So this is the potential due to a single dipole, which is pointing along the z-direction. 
and we can easily imagine that this form will be dominant when the when this uh, when this uh, distance r is much less than a, where a is the size of this uh, spherical cavity. Then this whole thing grows as one over r square, and that will obviously dominate the potential due to this external electric field. Uh, and the the potential generated, the potential associated with this uniform external electric field E0 is, uh, is this guy, minus E0 times Z, the coordinate, and that has a spherical coordinate representation uh, like that, R times cosine theta. And uh, obviously that will dominate the whole uh, potential field when R is much bigger than A. Right, because this thing grows linearly with r, whereas this thing falls off as the square of r. Okay, so each has its own region of dominance, but the true solution, of course, has a has a mixture of both. Uh, but the fortunate thing about this situation is that both potentials have the same uh, potential, same sorry, has the same angle dependence, cosine theta. So it's easy to imagine that in the exact solution, whatever that may be, uh, should only have one of these uh, one of these Legendre polynomials uh, in the solution because other Legendre polynomials simply has the wrong kind of angular dependence. All right. So uh, then from uh, the lecture that we had last time, uh, it should be clear that the general solution is always of this form. That is, uh, you have to have some r to the first power and then r to the minus second power uh, multiplying this uh, cosine theta. And if you look at these terms individually, then that's exactly what we had already over here. One is the potential due to a dipole, and the other one is due to a uniform electric field. Okay, so even if you did not have these uh, physical motivations behind you, then you would have uh, obtained the same conclusion just from purely mathematical, uh, from purely mathematical consideration, I guess. All right, so according to the uh, physical considerations we have made above, uh, we can surmise that the solution, the exact solution must be of this form when uh, r is less than the radius of the cavity. That is, uh, you must have these, uh, you must have this part arising as a consequence of the presence of dipole. And it's entirely possible that you also have this uh, R linear part due, uh, presumably due to the influence of the external electric field. And uh, similarly, when you reconsider the region outside of the cavity, then uh, obviously there would be this uh, first term coming from the uniform external electric field but there just might be an additional contribution that falls off as the inverse r square because it's general it's it's allowed by the general uh, solution of the laplace equation and uh so we have these uh, two separate types of solutions for both the interior and the exterior of the cavity and they must connect smoothly across this uh, boundary at r equal to a. And so these uh, potentials must fulfill this uh, continuity condition of the potential across the, across the boundary surface. Uh, and there's a second condition to be obeyed between the between the uh, electric fields on the inside of the cavity and the one on the outside. But unlike the boundary conditions that we saw in the last lecture, this one has this uh, factor of kappa, 
multiplying the electric field of the uh, region outside the cavity. And this uh, extra factor kappa arises due to the screening effect. Uh, the dielectric material, basically what it does is to screen out some of the electric field that tries to enter that uh, dielectric region from uh, outside. So, for example, if this uh, cavity region, which I drew as a little circle here, had the uh, electric field, uh, uh, let's say, uh, let's call it E in, uh, then uh, as soon as it crosses over into the dielectric region, the size of these uh, electric field, which I wrote as E out, is immediately reduced by this uh, factor of the inverse of the dielectric constant. Because right along this uh, boundary, you have some accumulated uh, dipoles that will screen out the electric field coming in uh, from the out outside into the dielectric region. Okay, so this is, uh, this sort of physical reasoning is why you have to have a boundary condition look that looks like that. And uh, in trying to satisfy both of these uh, boundary conditions, so this is a pair of equations. There are two equations to be satisfied. And, uh, and luckily, we also have two unknowns, A and B, to be solved for. So you can solve them. Solve uh, for A and B in terms of various parameters like the uh, cavity radius A and uh, the electric constant kappa, and you can solve them and obtain uh, both of these coefficients. And uh, obtaining the expression, exact expression for these two coefficients will be uh, part of your uh, homework exercise problems uh, for this week's lecture. And once you obtain uh, these coefficients, you can also show that the uh, electric field right at the origin, that's where the dipole would be located, is uh, given by this uh, fairly complex expression, which would be uh, quite fun to drive. So again, this the derivation of this uh, expression is another piece of homework exercise problems that I want to give out to you this week. Okay, so summary of the lecture and uh, and these two solutions, coefficients A and B, and the electric field at the origin. These are the additional homework problems that you need to present solutions for. All right, so then... Uh, Let's wrap up this uh, part of the uh, discussion for Laplace equation. Uh, so now I'm going to move to uh, a different coordinate system. Or rather, uh, I will stay in the spherical coordinate system, but this time I delete this uh, assumption that the, there's no dependence on the... Uh, on the azimuthal angle phi. So basically what I'm trying to do is to, is to solve this uh, Laplace equation under the most general situation in the spherical coordinate system. All right, so um, actually I, I try to present this as a homework problem. Uh, to derive this uh, expression for the Laplacian in the spherical coordinate, but I realized that that would have some overlap with the homework problem I gave out in the last lecture, so I will rather not give you this as a homework uh, because of the overlap with the previous one. But let's just take this for granted and try to uh, walk our way through the solution of this problem 
by introducing once again the separation of variables technique and um, the general philosophy of the technique dictates that I try to write the solution of this problem as some function that depends only on, on the radial coordinate r and possibly the other other uh, function that depends on the two angular coordinates. All right, so under this uh, preliminary separation, then let's see what uh, sort of equations are being obeyed by each one of these components. Uh, first of all, it's easy to verify that the radial component has to satisfy uh, this equation. Uh, so whenever you have a separation of variables technique, then you should introduce some uh, arbitrary constants. And in this case, the arbitrary constants are expressed as uh, L times L plus 1 um, for reasons that I hope you guys are already familiar with from uh, mathematical physics. If not, you're welcome. You're advised to go back to possibly chapter one of this book and review the necessary background. Okay, so the same coefficients of, of course appears in the equation for the other piece of the solution, namely the piece I wrote as y. Uh, and that's this... Uh, uh, horrendous looking equation. Uh, there are so many uh, there are so many signs and uh, I mean it just looks nuts and uh, you know if I were to ask you to sit down and try to solve derive the solution to this equation then it would be uh, completely unfair uh, not only because this is a this is a challenging problem, but also because luckily this problem had been solved by some uh, mathematicians a couple of hundred years back, and there's no reason to go through this uh, same difficult step that they must have gone through a couple of centuries ago. So we just borrow their knowledge. That's that's the basic idea. Okay, the, this the radial part of the equation is quite easy to solve. It's, uh, it's this part. Um, and if this solution looks familiar to you, actually it, it should because it's exactly the same solution that we found in the previous lecture when we assumed a certain symmetry of the solution, but uh, back then we were still working in the spherical coordinates, and so it's no wonder that uh, exactly the same kind of wave function obtains in this case as well. So you, we quickly realized that by dropping this uh, assumption of symmetry under the rotation about the z-axis, uh, we don't change anything about the radial dependence, but what we do, what we do change is the is the function that captures the dependence on these uh, angular coordinates. So to be specific, uh, sorry, this should have been the second derivative of y with with respect to the azimuthal angle phi, and this. Thing was basically zero in our previous consideration. And that's why this entire term was missing and therefore we had to deal only with a pretty simple equation called the Legendre equation. Okay, but once we uh, take that this is not necessarily zero, then uh, that we must face that modification and learn how to deal with it. Um, so let's see, let's think about how we might deal with it. 
Okay, so if this was non-zero, uh, right? So if this was non-zero, so this the second derivative of this y function was some constant minus m squared times the function itself, uh, which means that the phi dependence of this uh, function y would be like this uh, harmonic function. And, and presumably you know that m can only be an integer because phi is the angle. So when phi changes by 2 pi, then you pretty much come back to the same point. And therefore, you must obtain exactly the same value as before. And the only way that can be uh, ensured is by allowing, by restricting m to be uh, only integers. Okay, so, um, well, the uh, overall solution is written in this way. Uh, it's called the spherical harmonics. Uh, so when I say overall solution, I mean the solution to this uh, to this whole problem with uh, this uh, second derivative being replaced by minus m squared times the y function. And that solution, which depends on both of these constants, l and m, uh, they're known as spherical harmonics. And... You probably know this already that L can only be non-negative integers such as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And M can only be integers ranging between minus L and plus L. So if L is 2, then M is minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, Okay, so if you're not already familiar with these things, uh, maybe it's good for you to go back to some math physics textbooks or, or quantum textbooks to see where all of these things came from. Um, as a minimal requirement for your familiarity with these functions, I, I want you to look up tables uh, mathematical tables or uh, whatever and just write down expressions explicitly for these uh, spherical harmonics when L is 0 and when L is 1 and L is 2. So when L is 1 you only have one such spherical harmonics function. L is 1 then you have three different kinds of spherical harmonics L is 2, then you have five different kinds of spherical harmonics. And just to make sure that you're not entirely uh, scared of these, uh, this uh, new function, I just want you to be able to write them down. Okay? You don't have to derive them. You just look them up from somewhere and just write them down here. Uh, that's the homework. Okay, um, so um, although this uh, function made its appearance as a solution to the Laplace equation in the uh, problem of electrostatics, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you already encounter this uh, exact same function in the context of angular momentum theory in quantum mechanics, for example. Um, and the same function plays a vital role if uh, you're studying the quantum chemistry of solids, uh, you know, d orbitals, p orbitals, and so on. Um, so although, um, we're talking about some solutions to electrostatics problem in some spherical coordinate system. Actually, the functions that we end up finding has applications far beyond the realm of electrostatics. It plays a vital role in the quantum theory of angular momentum, for example, which is completely unrelated to electrostatics. 
Okay, and the reason obviously is that this uh, Laplacian operator shows up both in equations of ele electrostatics but also shows up in equations of quantum mechanics and that equation is well it's nothing but the Schrodinger equation of course okay so now let's move to the Laplace equation in yet another cylindrical coordinate so, so far we've talked about solving Laplace equation in the rectangular coordinates, in the spherical coordinates, with and without this uh, particular symmetry under the rotation about the z-axis. And we uh, saw that many different kinds of functions show up depending on whether you impose this extra symmetry or not. And now we're going to go to these uh, third important coordinate system known as the cylindrical coordinate. And in that coordinate system, uh, where z axis is still called the z axis, but the x and y axis are turned into the radial coordinate rho and the angular coordinate phi the Laplacian operator takes on this form. Okay, and if you're not already familiar with this, uh, with the way that this expression came about, you should probably go back to uh, chapter one and review the derivation. Um, in any case, this is a homework problem, again, to uh, show how this particular expression of the Laplacian operator in the cylindrical coordinate system arises. Okay, uh, so I want you to be able to present the uh, derivations of these uh, of this expression. Okay. Okay, so it's entirely possible that you're starting to feel tired of listening to all these different versions of Laplace equations and all these uh, special functions that pop up depending on different coordinates and, uh, and then you start to feel lost or bored or confused. And uh, that's entirely understandable. Uh, if this is your first time exposure to this whole array of special functions, then, uh, then it's entirely legitimate for you to be uh, confused. Um, and, and I, I actually uh, don't need to offer any apologies for those of you who feel that way because this is basically uh, this, this is basically what it's about. Uh, when you say you're learning electrostatics at a higher level, then you're basically saying that you're learning how to solve all these uh, Laplace equations in different coordinate systems and learning how to deal with all these uh, different special functions. It can be said that special functions have been invented to solve Laplace equations. So the, the whole dictionary, the whole encyclopedia of the special functions uh, is closely tied up with the uh, problem of Laplace equations and its solutions. There's no way to separate those two. Okay, so um, you have to deal with them, you have to familiarize yourself with them, and uh, I just see no way around it. All right? But uh, at least let me offer you some reason as to why you want to familiarize yourself with these uh, problems. Okay? So suppose you have a cylinder of radius a 
uh, it's the cylinder has an infinite extension, and half of it is at potential v1. The other half is at potential v2, and v1 and v2 are necessarily uh, the same. If they were the same potential, of course, things would be uh, things would be really simple. However, um, however, life is not necessarily all that simple all the time, so we better learn how to deal with uh, this more complex situation. Okay, and these two different potentials, potential surfaces are joined together at this, uh, at along this uh, circle, which is located at the coordinate z equal to zero. So this vertical direction is the z coordinate, and you can imagine that this whole thing has a cylindrical symmetry about it. So it would be, it would be no wonder uh, if I say that it's best to try and solve this problem in the uh, in the cylindrical coordinate, um, and that the potential should be dependent on these two coordinates namely the radio coordinate rho and the coordinate along the z direction. And there is no dependent on the uh, angle phi because of this uh, cylindrical symmetry inherent in this problem. All right, so that means in this uh, general Laplace equation scheme, uh, that part will be zero, so we don't have to deal with that. So that's a zero, but we still have these other two pieces, which sum up to zero. And uh, again, we try the separation of variables strategy and write the solution as the product of a function that depends only on the coordinate r and the function that depends only on the coordinate z. Okay, so then, uh, then after the after going through the familiar steps, uh, the uh, Laplace equation is turned into something that looks like this. So we have one piece that only depends on the z coordinate, one piece that depends only on the rho coordinate, and they add up to zero. So, as before, one way to solve this problem is to say that this combination would be equal to some constant k square, hence this combination would be equal to some other constant minus the same constant that is minus k square, and they add up to zero. If that were the case, If that were the case, then uh, if that were the case, then this part would uh, would give the solution like this. Okay, uh, some exponential dependence in the coordinates, while uh, while this uh, radial dependent part would obey uh, this coordinate. So um, this, this equation is sort of uh, expressed in a form that is hard to understand. So I have expanded this equation into something that is more recognizable, like this. And in fact, this is uh, this is nothing but a special case of what's known as the Bessel equation. Okay, in in general, the Bessel equation uh, looks like that. And the equation that we have over here is missing this alpha square part. And the solution to such a such an equation is called the uh, zero to order Bessel equation. And there are two such solutions. One is written as a J0. 
the other one written as n0 okay and uh, this uh, Bessel equation j0 you may have heard of and this n0 is what's known as the Neumann solution uh, uh, again uh, these uh, if you don't know what they look like then it's not very helpful because if you don't know what they look like then these are just names and names don't mean anything uh, unless you know what they look like okay so I want you to take the the time and the trouble to figure out what these uh, two functions look like and actually plot them on uh, on a on a piece of graph you don't have to plot the exact shape uh, you can for example ask your uh, Mathematica program to plot this and uh, use your pen to make a rough replica of these functions on your uh, summary and that will be enough just something some kind of plot that will show that will prove that you have a, you have seen uh, these functions and and familiarize with yourself with the shape of these functions that's what I that's what I require uh, from you as a, as a homework problem Okay, so that's what we get. That's what we get if we choose uh, this thing as minus k square and this thing as the plus k square. But it may well be that the other choice is also possible. Like this thing is equal to some minus k square and this thing is equal to some plus k square. And uh, that's perfectly... Uh, reasonable assumptions to to impose in that case then these uh, then for the z part we have an oscillatory uh, function as the answer um, while the uh, the radial part uh, obeys the equation that looks very similar to the Bessel function uh, Bessel equation sorry except there's an overall there's a minus sign over here and the solution to this is also known and it's also called the Bessel function but with the extra extra uh, adjective uh, modified so it's a modified Bessel function okay so there are two modified Bessel functions at the zeroth order one is called I0 and the other one is called K0 and once again, if you don't know what they look like, then these names don't mean anything. So again, I want you to take the time and the trouble to figure out what these two functions look like and, and make plots of these functions uh, as, part of your, um, as part of your homework summary. Okay, thanks.